freedom of religion or the freedom of worship in uh, the holy places for 15 minutes, it will be almost an impossible mission, but I will do my best. Anyhow, I think that my topic will be very close to you as it has a lot to do with religion, with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I, I think I, I should open my, my speaking by saying that, for instance, one uh, rabbi, very famous rabbi, uh, asked where God exists, and his answer was in everywhere that you, pu that you put him in your heart. On the New Testament, it's written that the God who did the world and everything which is in, in it will not live in uh, human-made temples because he is the master of the sky on the earth. On the other hand, Hieronymus, one of the ancestors of Christianity, said, I prefer the place where he stood to see in your own eyes the uh, uh, place of birth or the place of suffering of Jesus. Or there was another Islamic uh, scholar who said, when you look for, for God, look for him in your heart. He is not in Jerusalem, not in Mecca, and not in the Hajj. But in spite of all these uh, clever verses, as we are human beings, we need a geographical, a physical place to exercise our freedom of religion or our freedom of worship, to pray for our God in a certain place, in spite of the fact that in all religions you say that God is everywhere. But people believe that in some geographical, physical place, God is more than in another place. This is a paradox, which is a good topic for another lecture. But just to mention it, because my topic is to speak a little bit about uh, the policy of Israel concerning the freedom of religion and the freedom of worship in the holy places. In order to understand or to evaluate Israel policy, we need some short historical background. Well, I want to mention to you that in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, stood three temples. One was built by King Solomon. The second one was built from the Jews that came from Babylon at the middle of the sixth century before Christ. And the third one was built by King Herod about, let's say, at the middle of the first, at the last century before Christ. And this, the third temple, was destructed by the Romans, as you all know, at the age of <coughs> 70 uh, AC. Now, what is interesting is right afterwards there was a very big Jewish rebellion because the Roman planned to put a statute of uh, a Roman statute on the Temple Mount, and there was a rebellion of Bar Kokhva. I don't know if you know this name. Anyhow, it was finished at the age of 135 by the complete destruction of Jerusalem. And then Adrianus Caesar came to, the, he was in charge of it. He wiped out all the Jews from Jerusalem, drive them out of the country, <clears throat> and in order to, to finish the Jewish connection to Israel, to the country of Israel, he invented a new name to Israel, which is, had a very actual significance. He called Israel in, Su in Syria, he didn't call them any, anymore Israel, but the province of Syria and Palestine. This is the origin of the, of the name Palestine, because of the Plishtim. If you know the Bible, the Plishtim, he wanted to say, this is not the country of the Jews, this is the country of the, of the Palestinians, Palestine and Syria, this is the original 
the origin of this name, Palestine. The Jews were dragged out. There was no freedom of religion for the Jews, not at the Roman time, not after the first conquer of the country by the Arabs. And if we speak with, uh, let's say, very classical examples, I would say that after the Arabs defeated the Crusaders at the 12th century, you know, their famous commander was Salah Adin, non-Muslims were prohibited, were not allowed to enter any Muslim holy place. Now we are talking especially about the cave of the ancestors, of our ancestors in Hebron. Since the 12th century and up to 1967, you know, the Six Days War, Jews and Christians were not allowed to enter this holy place for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The, almost the same is for the Temple Mount. Non-Muslims were not allowed to enter the, the Temple Mount, to come there, to pray, to visit, whatever, since the 12th century up to 1967, except an intermission at the beginning of the 12th century. More than this, on, we have two judgments of a Turkish Muslim court in Jerusalem from the 16th century. The two cases were the same. A group of Jews were sentenced to be beaten in public in the, on the market. And the second judgment, the same judgment against a group of Christians. And their crime was that they were, st they, they were staying on a roof of a building, looking to the, in the direction of the Temple Mount. There was their, their crime. Because even they looking to the Temple Mount, they were sentenced to be beaten in public place by the Ottoman uh, government. Now, if we jump ahead, <coughs> I will tell you about the attitude of the Muslims to Jews that were coming to pray in the Wailing Wall. As we know, according to witnesses, they appeared in front of a, com a commission of inquiry, the show inquiry, if you know this name, at the age of 1930, after there were the events of 1929, when 130 Jews were killed and more than 300 were wounded by Arab riots that started in the Wailing Wall as a matter of the struggle of who is going to control, who is, who is the owner of the Wailing Wall. <coughs> then according to the witnesses that came to, give the, to, 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 give, to, to, come, to come there and to prove the rights of the Arabs, of the Jews, on this holy place. We know from what we read about the, these witnesses that Muslims were used at the, at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century to desecrate deliberately this place. First of all, Jews that were that wanted to come to the Wailing Wall to pray, had to pay protection money to all the neighbors on the Maghreb quarter, so they will allow them just to come close to the Wailing Wall. Other Muslims throw on the wall human feces. Other, I'm saying it, other Muslims were used to drive near the Wailing Wall, sheep and cows, again to have, to make it dirty, and if it was not enough, they were used to bring cut hairs from barber shops and to scatter it all over <laughs> as a matter of sacrilege or to violate the Jewish sanctity. What is more interesting, that on the age of 1923, when Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti, the highest religious authority, became the leader of the Waqf, 
of the Supreme Muslim Council that was in charge of all the holy places, he declared that the Welling Wall is a holy place for the Muslims. In spite of what, what I told you, and he told all the world that this place is holy because their prophet, Muhammad, the prophet, tied his horse after the nightly journey when he landed on the Temple Mount, he tied his horse especially to this wailing wall. And if you don't believe me, if you go to the Temple Mount, they will show you a certain place near the Maghreb Gate where, where Muhammad the Prophet really tied his horse. But if you ask Muslim scholars, let's say on the 18th century, before they start fighting with the Jews on the Wailing Wall, where Muhammad the Prophet tied his horse, they will show you six, seven, or eight other places, no, it, no one of them near the Wailing Wall. Anyhow, <coughs> when we, we, we take these examples, I, I mentioned them only to give you a tools to evaluate Israel policy. Now you have to know, I don't speak about the, the period between 1948 to 1967, because in this period, all the most holy places were in the, uh, in the area of Jordan. Jerusalem, East Jerusalem was under the control, under the regime of Jordan. But, but what you have to know is Jordan, which now, which on 1972 put the old city on the list of heritage, which is under danger, you know, UNESCO has such a list. Jordan government bombed and desecrated 35 synagogues, desecrated about 45 tombstones on the Mount of Olives. And if you go even today, tomorrow morning, you go to visit Chamuri, nice Arabs on the old city, in few apartments you will find on the wall a huge stone, a tombstone, saying here was buried Rabbi so and so on the ear of so and so. Not to tell that they used these stones to cover passes in military camps or WC mili in military camps and we have picture of this so and so. So let's go afterwards to the policy of Israel. When Israel conquered or hold, you call it according to your political opinion about, about it after the Six Day War, East Jerusalem and the West Bank, first time in history, Israel was the regime, was in possession of the most holy places to Christianity and to Islam. And I mention only the Holy Sepulchre Church, the Church of Nativity, the Cave of Ancestors in Hebron, and of course, above all, the Temple Mount, which is a holy place, which is holy for Jews, for Christians, and for Muslims. Unfortunately, today, there is no temple there. There are only five Muslim mosques there. And let's see how Israel is managing with all these holy places. I would say that Israel learned the historical lesson and the goal of safeguarding the freedom of religion, the freedom of worship, and the, and the, free, the right of free access to the holy places, which is, of course, the main expression of these freedoms is ensured in Israel very, very carefully. And it, we have an expression to this policy on the legal status that these freedoms have in Israeli law. The freedom of religion or the freedom of worship or the right of free access are superior rights in Israeli law. 
we are not in the faculty of law, so that I don't give you all the uh, precedents of the Supreme Court or other sources, but I will tell you that in the, the most important, the most important law that Israel enacted right after the unification of Jerusalem is an historical one without any precedent in history in any country on the world and especially not in, in Israel. Not the Turks, not the British Empire, not Jordan. Nobody has such, such an act. And I want to, to mention it and to, write, and to read from it one, one article. It's called The Protection of the Holy Places Law and it was enacted on June, at the end of June 1967. The first article said, the holy places shall be protected from the secretion and any other violation and from anything likely to violate the freedom of access of the members of the different religions to the places sacred to them or their feelings with regard to those places. It's a huge definition, it's a huge defending of the freedom of religion, the freedom of worship, and the freedom of or the right for free access. Not only the places are defended, and even the feelings of Christian, Muslims, and Jews towards these places. You see, if you insult somebody and you curse the, the Holy Sepulchre, you can be indicted for a criminal for a criminal offense, according to this article, and the punishment can get to seven years imprisonment. Never, there never exist, have never existed such a law in the Turkish time, in the British mandate, or in Jordan rule all over Israel, okay? And as we know, according to the High Court judgments, these freedoms have a superior status in the law of Israel, and if those verdicts said that every other right, every other human right, basic right, constitutional right, should be interpreted, interpreted, and especially the, any other law, by such a way that will put upstairs as a superior right the right for the freedom of religion or the freedom of worship and the right for free access to those uh, holy places without discrimination between Jews, Arabs, and Christians. And I want to exemplify it by speaking about certain places. Now, when there is a regular Jewish holy place, no problem. When there is a regular Christian holy place, no problem. And especially for, and the same for the Arabs. What do I mean? I mean that Israel has some very important principles that are applying to these places. For the Christians, if we start with them, the first principle will be autonomy. Every Christian community can manage, can direct its holy places according to their rules, and Israel will not interfere unless there is a breach of the public order, which is a superior criteria, or a criminal offense. But daily speaking, Israel government will not interfere in the inner management of any Christian, Muslim, or Jewish place. The second principle with Christian places is keeping or ensuring the status quo. The status quo, when we are speaking about the Christian holy places, means, first of all, the Ottoman status quo. At the, at the middle of the 18th century, of the 19th century, the <laughs> Turkish Sultan stated the rights of the Christian in the most important Christian holy places in Israel, Seven, there are seven of these. Four in Jerusalem and three outside Jerusalem in Bethlehem. And there is 
a written document that specifying the rights on every window, every lamp, every wall in these seven holy places. The first one is the Holy Sepulchre Church. The second one is Deir el Sultan, the monastery of the Sultan, which is on the roof of the Holy Sepulchre. The third one is the tomb of uh, uh, Maria, the Virgin, in Gat Shemanim. The fourth one is the Church of the Assumption on the top of the Mount of Olives. Three are in Bethlehem, the Church of Nativity, the Church of the Milk, and the Shepherd's Field. As you are Christian, I guess you know what happened in each place that I've just mentioned. This Ottoman status quo got an international validation and it's recognized by the powers of Europe at the end of the Crimean War, at the contract of Berlin, at the mandate document, and it was also recognized by, by, the, by Jordan and is valid in Israel even nowadays. If there will be a dispute between two Christian communities in the Holy Sepulchre Church, who has the right to clean a certain lamp, they will look in that document that was rewritten by, uh, by, the, by the British officer in the Monday time, and they will fix that according to the status quo, this right belongs to that certain community. I can give you four examples, few examples of disputes like this, but it's again out of my time. According, in order to enforce this status quo and to keep the public order in all, uh, in all the holy places, Israel established a special police unit for protection of the holy places, about 150 policemen. All of them are experts about the status quo in the, in the Christian holy places. Wow. And you can see them especially on Easter and on Christmas in uh, the Church of Holy Sepulchre by, of course, by the consent of the six com Christian communities that have rights in this place and in the Church of Nativity where we, where we, where we hold uh, this holy place. Now it's the hand of the Palestinian Authority. Israel will help them to enforce the status quo. Israel will help all religions by giving exemptions of taxes for all the holy places. Israel will give diplomatic passports to high clergymen and will help them in different things, especially when it concerns the building of new holy places or renovating an old holy place. The same goes for the Jews, of course, although the Jews have no status quo, and, but the Jews also are good in fighting on rights on the holy place. It's a nice story what is happening in the tomb of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Never mind if you didn't hear his name because you are a Christian. We Jews, when we tell stories about your disputes in the holy places, then you can answer us with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But I have to say in brackets that I, now I suddenly a word that I'm speaking to Protestants. Protestants don't have the same ideology about holy places. And as I know, you don't look for rights in the holy places. And the only holy place for, let's say, that is typical Protestant is the Church of the Garden in East Jerusalem where Protestants think Jesus uh, was buried and not in, not in the Holy Sepulchre. But generally speaking, Protestants don't have the same ideology that there are geographical, physical, holy places that you have to fight on the right in these places. The last chapter of my small lecture is maybe the most interesting. Let's see what Israel is doing with the problematic places, 
those that sanctity is common to Jews and Muslims, and sometimes even to Christians. And the two biggest examples or typical examples will be the Cave of Ancestors and the, te and the Temple Mount. In the Cave of Ancestors, up to 1994, up to the massacre of Dr. Goldstein, this uh, crazy guy that killed uh, about 29, or I'm not sure about the number, Muslim while they were praying in the, in the cave, Jews and Muslims were used to pray together in this place in different hours. But after this massacre, the government decided to divide this holy place physically. There is a physical division, division in this place, and Jews can pray whenever they want, but only on their part, and Muslims can pray whenever they want on their part. No connection between the two places, the two parts, and the Israeli army is taking care that there will not be clashes between the Jews and the Muslims in the cave on Arsesso. And this works very good, very well, since 1994 up to now. The most interesting place is the Temple Mount. After the Six-Day War, we know that Moshe Dayan and the high, uh, few uh, army commanders visit the Temple Mount, and then uh, Shamgar, was the, uh, the public attorney of the army, paid attention to uh, Diane that there, an Israeli flag is on the Dome of the Rock. He gave an order to, to, to put it down immediately. And he arranged the arrangement with the wax, with the uh, Muslim council, which is in charge of the holy places, that from 67 up to now, the arrangement will be as follows. Jews, will, non-Muslims, will be allowed to visit the Temple Mount, but not to pray there. All the security forces of Israel are taking care with the waqf assistance. The Jews will not pray on the Temple Mount. There is, the, there is, there is a, a very strict procedure saying, listen, you can stand like this on the Temple Mount and look like this. If you do like this, you will be arrested. <laughs> if you, you stand like this and you say, you will be arrested. No, it's not, they, they don't allow any external expression of Jewish praying on the Temple Mount. You can't go inside with books. Maybe you hide some praying there. You can't do like this. And if you know there are certain Jewish prayers that you have to do like this, it's not allowed. Even more than this, a year ago, a guy that was supposed to get married on that evening came to the Temple Mount and took like this some else and put it in his pocket. You know that in, in, in the marriage ceremony, we break a, a glass, you know, this is in memory of the destruction of the temple. And he wanted, after the, doing like this, to scatter some soil on the earth. He was arrested. And they told him, don't you know that you are not allowed to, to touch the temple mount, to take anything, and so and so and so? I hope you know all the destruction that the Arabs made on all the antiquities and archaeological findings on the temple mount. But never was an Arab uh, submitted to court, not to say punished because of this. So Israel non-Muslims are allowed to visit the Temple Mount, not to pray there at all. On the other side, Muslims have five mosques there and are allowed, of course, to pray. And what is more interesting, when Israel came there in 1967, the Muslims said Al-Aqsa, Kipata Sela, the Dome of the Rock, and the Mosque of, of the Horse, of, you know, Al-Burak, where Muhammad tied his horse. 
on the age of Bibi Netanyahu as, as the, the prime minister and Barak prime minister, Israel was afraid to fight against it and the Arabs built huge two more mosques, one called Al-Aqsa, the old one, and the other one called the El Marwan place, both on the Temple Mount, and they have other plans, and Israel didn't do anything because both prime ministers were afraid to deal with the Arab. So you can see how in the most holiest place for the Jews, Jews are not allowed to pray. They can pray only in the Wailing Wall, which is the western part of the wall that surrounded the Temple Mount. But in the inside the place, where the Holy of Holies for the Jews, Jews are not allowed to pray. They are there, five mosques, and one of them, the Dome of the Rock, is in, in the center of the old temple of the Jews, up, and it covers the rock. The rock which is inside this mosque is the Holy of Holies for the Jews, that only the high, post, high priest could enter only on the Day of Atonement. But this is an external example how Israel take care on the freedom of religion, the freedom of worship, and the freedom of free access to the holy places on the count of the Jews and in favor of the Muslims. Thank you very much.